Hey, I'm Dr. Lance Von Stade. This is a video to follow up from our first How to Squat Properly video, which after watching that one, I imagine you're thinking to yourself, man, is that really how to squat properly or is that just to poke fun at myself on how to not properly squat? Because a lot of people we've been getting feedback from are, okay, okay, I did that, it's ridiculously difficult. What do I do now? Or what does this mean? So we wanna invite you now to perform that first video if you haven't done it yet where we have the tripods of the feet, the decompression breathing, and then as you sink one inch and reorganize, one inch and reorganize, you're gonna run into a place where either it becomes difficult to maintain the stability of your spine, you start to feel tightness in the hip or knee, or you notice that one of the tripod points of the feet end up coming off the ground. So we want now to help you find out what that means for you. This video, we're gonna to try to break it out to keep it very simple. There's thousands of cues you can use to in, engage somebody into a squat. This is where personal trainers can come in. Or you can start to use those cues after doing mobility movements and things that we'll get into in future videos and then retest yourself using the squat as simply a, a functional test. Today, three different contributing factors are most common for why someone would have a hard time getting into a squat. And again, you have 206 bones, they all have joints together, so it can be any joint in your body that's limited and restricted that can contribute to this. But the three most common regions that we find, the ankle, the hip, or the spine. So these are three joints that are supposed to have a large range of motion that if that is somewhat compromised, it can compromise the entire global movement of a squat. So how do you find out which one it is for you? We'll start with the ankle. So this is a simple, put your foot up against a wall or some type of structure where you can go into dorsiflexion. Start simple with your toes right up against it. And what I'd like for you to do is instead of having your big toe pointing forward and then testing, because if you look at this, now my toe and my knee is going straight over my big toe. Instead of outward, like we talked about in that first video, we actually want to be able to put a straight line in between the middle toe and that outside ring toe and still have tripod pressure and the knee lateral to that. If you're already struggling there, then you know your ankle is a contributing factor for this. But if you're able to put your toes parallel, the angle of your toes parallel, and some people have some weird feet, but if <laughs> you get the picture, have the angle of your toes parallel with the wall, and then as you're here, don't just passively go with this. Actually dorsiflex your back toe, get into a nice lunge position, and then bring that knee to the wall. Then you can go two or three or four fingers, get into that lunge position, and lunge forward, bringing that knee forward and outward, keeping that tripod pressure. Then you can come out with a fist or a thumb and a fist. And I already know that this ankle is too limited to do this. I've had a high ankle sprain. I've fractured this ankle in track. So as I come now into this position, forward and laterally, I can't quite get there. So I could get there if I mobilized. Again, in future videos, we'll give you some strategies to do that. For now, I'm just gonna see, okay, that's as far as I can go with this side. And then, my good ankle, or my ankle where I have a little bit more range of motion, I'll just come right to that, that uh, thumb and fist, get into my lunge position, my toes are parallel, and then I'm here, stabilize, decompress, and then I can easily get to that, that structure. I could probably even go a little bit further, coming out and down, keeping pressure in the heel, inside, outside, ball of the foot, coming all the way and touching. If you're able to go all the way to that thumb and a fist, you're looking pretty good. If you're doing that and you have some pain or dysfunction or you don't think that your technique is perfect, add it in, ankle, upper cervical, those are the two areas that give the most feedback mechanically to the brain so the brain knows where it is in space and can organize the body. So prioritize ankle range of motion before I do any heavy lifting, squatting. I definitely prioritize this. Ankle foot mobility is part of my morning routine every day. However, during the day when I go to lift my son because I just saw him and he's happy, I don't sit there and say, hold on, and mobilize my foot and ankle before I lift him. So this is why we have to do it in the moments when we don't have crisis, so that when we have those moments of unpredictable forces that are needed or a crisis arises where we have to squat or move quickly, if you stay mobilized, you never have to get mobilized. So be ready for that. So that's the one for the ankle. The next one that can contribute oftentimes is the hip. So if you don't have enough hip flexion, bring your knees to your chest, then how do you know if your spine is able to get into that position or not? So what you'll notice here is I want space underneath my back. So if you can't put your hand here or if you're lacking range of motion here, you can put a towel rounded or something underneath your spine. 
if I lift my knees toward my chest and all of a sudden my back rounds and flattens, that's not actually motion from the hip. I may have had motion from the hip up to here, and if I get stuck, now my back is gonna flatten and all of that motion comes from my lumbar spine. Okay, so the test is, can I keep an arch in my back? I can do my decompression breath and stabilize like that boa constrictor is wrapping around me and I'm trying to breathe against it. Keep that pressure, and you can have your hands wherever you want them, but then bring your knees as high as you can to your chest. The goal here is basically, if you wanna be able to squat to 90 degrees, you have to be able to get your knees up to your belly button, and this is active range of motion, and then I can also maintain that curve and give it a passive range of motion, which in a gravity environment when I'm standing would be a little more accurate. So from here, I'm dorsiflexing my toes, engaging as much as I can, keeping the arch in my low back, and can I get my knees past my belly button or even up close to my rib cage if I wanna see if I can do a really deep squat? Again, I'm wanting my knees to come up and out. I'm not just pulling straight up, straight up and then out, and then that will test whether or not you have the spine motion, I'm sorry, the hip motion, the third most contributing factor to a lack of range of motion for the squat is the spine. So in this position, you'll notice a lot of people testing extension with the cat camel. The problem I have with this is most commonly people will lift their face and then drop their belly button and there's, they're getting some decent extension but they're not focusing it into the thoracic spine. So we know that your lumbar is your low back, your thoracic is your upper back and your cervical is your neck and you'll notice that my neck is moving and my belly's dropping so my lumbar spine is getting some good extension, but how do we test the thoracic in the middle, the part that rounds this way? We don't want it to round so much that at the bottom of our squat, we're only able to go to here and then we have to lift our head like this. If we wanna get into a position where we can sit at the bottom of the squat with a neutral spine, we have to be able to extend from that thoracic spine. So how we do this, you can do that same cat camel, but instead of having your feet straight this way, put your knees together, all the way together to where it's like you could glue a quarter in between your thighs and hold that. Then take your feet as far away from the midline as possible. Again, if you're lacking range of motion in the hips here, you can put a yoga block here and pinch and then just move as far as you can comfortably to where you're not gonna cramp or anything in your TFL, one of the muscles that internally rotates the hips. And now from here, if you're all the way internally rotated at the hip, it is near impossible to be able to extend your lumbar spine. Your hip joint itself, because of the coupled motion, isn't gonna allow you to lift through that. So now, yes, you can extend your cervical spine, but any more extension that you get here, that's all gonna come from the thoracic spine. So because of this position here, not being able to use the lumbars, what you can do is come up on your fingertips, drop your head. The first thing that moves is your eyes look up, eyes, head, and then lift the chest as far forward as possible as you pull your hands towards you and then exhale all of your air, and that's the test. As you exhale all of your air, you'll feel the muscles contracting to stabilize the lumbar and the core, and as you inhale against those muscles, maintain that pressure, and then lift your sternum to try to see if you, how perpendicular to the ground can you get your sternum, and that's really to show that thoracic extension. So from here, internally rotated, I'm gonna look up with my eyes first, that kicks on my muscles of my neck, then I use those muscles to lift my head, and then I lift my sternum, exhale deep, keep those muscles fired, and then inhale and lift my chest. And that right there is trying to get my sternum as close to perpendicular to the floor, which is a great indicator for how much extension I have in my thoracic cage. So those are the three indicators that we'd like you to try to focus on as you're going through your squat. You can do these motions and even just doing these motions and then performing the squat again, you'll notice a change right away because you're using the areas that are typically gonna be lacking in range of motion for you. When you get to a point where that squat that you descend one inch by inch, you're getting those incremental changes just from even doing these with multiple repetitions, which if you're gonna do these, maybe do 10 repetitions for the first day and then see how you feel the next day. That's the real test of whether these are gonna be serving you in a good way or not. If you're too sore, then it's too much. But if you, over time, start to plateau on the changes you can get just from doing these simple fixes, then look into future videos we have where we're gonna break each of these out and show you if you have an ankle immobility or a lacking mobility of your ankle, 
Here's three different fixes for that. If it's your hip, here's three fixes for that. If it's your spine, we definitely recommend you're seeing a chiropractor to be getting the mobility into the joints, making sure you have full range, learning how to breathe properly. But then we'll give you some stuff that you can do to maintain that on your own. So you've already probably had some of those mobility videos in the past through the source sessions. If you haven't, you can go back and seek that out. But we'll, we'll look forward to continue to give you some resources. You being able to squat with ease is a prerequisite for you being able to see what's going down on the ground, bring things towards you. For me, I immediately think of my 15-month-old son. When I come home and I'm able to squat down and front squat him up to give him a nice hug, it's, uh, it's not something that I have to think about whether I have the function and the mobility to do. I'm able to be 100% present with him, and that, to me, is a, a high quality of life. Yeah.